person. We're going to take on a different exercise that's very similar, and the text is in Luke chapter 11. And uh, it's what I'm calling a spiritual exercise. And by spiritual exercise, what I'm talking about is an exercise whereby we might set aside the natural man in favor of the new man, the spiritual man. You know, some things are only understood by the spiritual man. The natural man cannot judge the things of the Spirit. We, I'm referring to the first two chapters in 1 Corinthians. It, 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 the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit or appraise them. Only a spiritual man. And so these exercises are an exercise of shifting gears, shifting out of our busy workaday world, our homemaking world, our parenting world, our in-school world, whatever, whatever it is where we have been uh, full steam ahead with our natural man, with our uh, outer man. And it's a way of shifting gears. And uh, as we used last week, the John 7:17 7, to shift gears, it was the exercise was in recognizing the truth of presenting our hearts to God with a willingness to do as what he presented it begins with desire, desiring to please God, desiring to do whatever it is he would reveal to us. That beginning place can take place any time we want to. It does not have to be when someone's teaching from the word or is some spiritual teacher. It can be uh, when your boss is uh, chewing you out on the line. It can be. Uh, when the guy's cutting you off in traffic. The whole, the whole issue is moving into the new man, learning to walk and live in the new man. I apply it here because most of us have been listening. Our, almost our entire spiritual life is wrapped up in listening to someone else tell us what it's all about. You can't do that. For very long. You've got to come to a place where you're hearing for yourself. Not hearing the man, but hearing God. Learning to recognize His voice. Becoming sensitive to what He's speaking. And so there's this, what I'm calling, shifting gears. That is, it is no longer walking after the flesh. No, no longer walking after a dependency upon our ability to perceive and judge and understand. Because the natural man just cannot understand very much. He's easily fooled. He's often in deception. It is the spiritual man that uh, apprises or appraises spiritual things, understands spiritual things. So it's a way of shifting gears. So here in Luke 11, we have another text in verse 52. And uh, there's something else unique. I know I'm covering a lot of ground. I, I know some of you last week were a little bit frustrated because I, I've covered so much. That's why we're putting these things in CDs. I know it's a little frustrating, but my intent is to, to leave you with a challenge on many of these fronts that up to this point, much of the church has ignored. And I, I intend to challenge you with this. I intend to, to stir up uh, issues. And some of them you'll just not be able to accept by my speaking. You shouldn't accept anything I say because I said it. Uh, you've got to come to a place where you're hearing God. And that's why I spend so much time on what we're calling spiritual exercises. But we're introducing here with this particular exercise uh, another realm that is another realm of understanding. It's going to be something we're going to spend at least one week on in the first seven-week series when we talk about the keys of the kingdom. Not keys to the kingdom, but keys of the kingdom. And you, we're going to find that this in this area of truth, uh, Jesus said, I am the truth. He was both the truth about God and the truth about man. Man as God created man to be. And he, he came to both show and live that truth. And it has everything to do with this gospel that he preached, which we are going to introduce this evening as an, an introduction. Uh, but it has everything to do with the kingdom. And we find that Jesus talks to, in Matthew 16, talks to Peter and the twelve about keys of the kingdom. If you were to ask most Christians, what are the keys? They could not tell you. 
No one's ever talked to them about what Jesus said were the keys of the kingdom. Jesus spent three and a half years teaching us how to live out of this other life. A life that, that Adam never tasted. A life that those who are in the world uh, have never touched. And most Christians in our ear have lived and died never really knowing or experiencing the joy of living out of the life for which they were created. It's been relegated to some sweet by and by, but that's not the promise. The promise is a now promise. And Jesus came to show us how to unlock the keys that open up that life to us. And so we have in this text, and I've chosen this particular exercise because it introduces one of the keys. It's in verse 52, and we're going to read it. It's a bit like John 7:17, 7, although there's a difference. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. Woe to you, lawyers. Actually, this text is a part of the Sermon on the Mount that you do not hear in the Matthew text, but in the Luke text, just as there were the blesseds, blessed are those who, and we have all of those blesseds, for example, in Matthew 5, we call them the Beatitudes. Actually, therefore, most of those blessed, there's a counter woe. Woe to you. Well, this is one of those woes. Woe to you, lawyers. But this particular woe has to do with uh, these lawyers taking away a particular key, robbing the people of a key. And it's called the key of knowledge. How did, they, how did these lawyers take away the key of knowledge? Well, he says here how they took it away. You yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. Much of what we know as modern-day American Christianity has been a knowing without a doing. It doesn't mean a thing what is preached if the life that is preaching it isn't walking it. You will translate what I'm saying by what you see of my life in the end. Those of you who know me most know, or any other, anyone else, you know that is true. They were taking away the key of knowledge because they themselves would not enter into the truth. There's a difference between, and this may seem contradictory, but it's not. It's just one step further than willing. There's a difference between willing and doing. The key to knowing, and we're talking about the key of knowledge here, but the key to knowing is presenting a heart that's willing to do. But have you ever found that once you hear, you're not so sure you're ready to do it? I've met many who have said that they were willing to do so and so for God, but when the opportunity came, when the situation emerged, there was no doing. If you have to stay in the realm of willing and cannot seem to pass on to the doing, you're not willing. And many who believe they are living with willing hearts, their lives prove them liars such as these lawyers. In the end, the willingness has to be translated into doing, entering in. The key to knowledge is not just the willing to do, but when the knowledge comes, doing it. Entering into the truth. Buying the truth. Buy truth and sell it not. Proverbs twenty three twenty three. We touched on that last week. When the truth comes, when the knowing comes, there's then the purchasing of it. You've not purchased it just by saying you're willing to do. It's not yours. That truth is not yours. That knowledge is not yours. Until there's the doing. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves would not enter in. 
And then there's this addition. And this is hard. If you won't enter in, in the end, you will keep those around you from entering in. You will take a posture. And that's one of the reasons we have such schisms in the church. Much of the schism in the church, much of the division in the church came about when the knowing came, but not a willing to do, a not a doing, not an entering in. If I determine that I will not buy that truth, in the end, I will buy a lie. Romans chapter 1. We won't turn to it, but just as a note here to, to make the point. It says of those who end up in such deceit that they, they trade the natural affections of man-woman for man-man, man-woman, woman. It all begins with knowing God they chose to believe a lie. There are no born atheists. And we'll look at that a couple of weeks down the road. But when we choose to reject the truth, we've got to have a lie. Adam and Eve needed a lie. And it was that lie that dethroned the God from their heart. An unwillingness to buy truth in a particular area forced upon them having to choose the lie. This issue of the key of knowledge, if we will not enter into the truth we hear, and I'll, I'll make this as an illustration. I'll use myself. I can think of, there are so many times in my life where I've heard someone teach something or preach something, and it was like a new revelation, and yet in the middle of it, I remembered, I've heard this before. And I remember how it excited me before. Two years later, I'm hearing it again. And it's like a new revelation. And then another two years, three years pass, and I hear it again. And it's like new revelation. But I know I've heard it before. I, I, I remember how it excited me before. Am I the only one in that camp? Do you know why it's like a new revelation? Because you never purchased it the first time around or the second time around, the third time around. And in doing that, you robbed yourself of the key, but you did more than that. You robbed those who were watching you of the key. Because you are not buying it caused you to live not, in, not just not in the truth, but it caused you to live in the lie in that very area. Not only did they not enter in, but they kept those who would enter in. And you will end up taking a position. And I have seen this. And in the, in the context of what we've just, just read, there isn't a better illustration in this hour than Christians and church leaders having to buy the lie concerning homosexual involvement. And you can, once you buy the lie, and those who are buying that lie are turning upside down the truth calling black white and white black, calling day night and night day. I mean, they've got their texts. They have their own churches. Why? Unwilling to buy the truth and needing now to protect the lie, they are now trying to keep anyone else from entering into the truth in that very area. Are you understanding well, what's the exercise? Just as we present to our Father a heart that is willing so that we might know, it is then offering to Him the desire that in knowing we shall do. And asking Him to help us hold our feet to that fire. Because it will take courage when it comes. And usually the truth that is hard to buy is the truth about number one. And, you know, God knows what truth I'm slow to buy. But it's presenting to, a God, to our Father even before we hear. I shall, by your grace, enter in. So won't you join me now as we turn to the Father and ask Him to help us 
in this area of entering in. Gracious Father, how we love Your ways. We wouldn't even have known You, Lord, had You not revealed Yourself. And even then, Lord, You drew us with strong cords of love. And how patient You've been with us, Lord. Lord, it's my testimony. It's John Brown's testimony that I've been slow to buy truth. I've been slow at entering in. But I'm asking on behalf of myself, but I'm asking also for my brothers and sisters, and I'm asking especially for those who right now are offering you a heart that is willing for you to do with them so that they can enter in. Do whatever you have to do, Lord, with us so that we're able to follow up on the willingness to do with the doing. And Father, for their sake, I, I'm just saying this. Uh, keep them from my teaching. Keep them from the teaching of all men. We're asking for You only to reveal Yourself and Your knowledge and Your truth. And to You and You alone, O oh Lord God, do we offer both a willingness to do and that we shall enter in by your grace. Now you teach us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. While we're on this topic, several have brought up areas that they heard me say and were just struggling with putting it together. And so I'm just going to lay it out fresh this evening, not to convince you of anything other than how to hear I have been wrong so many times in my life. I have been wrong up here teaching. And I'm not the only teacher or preacher who's been wrong. Your security cannot rest in the teacher's ability to build a strong apologetic in what he's teaching. Your security cannot lie in your ability to discern what's right and wrong. You are all, I trust, sons and daughters. And the Word says you have no need of any man to teach you because you've got the Spirit. All a teacher is is one whom God can use to create a situation where He can speak, He can speak, He can reveal to hearts what He would reveal. If you're listening to Him, I can be wrong. And you'll hear right. And you may recognize that I'm wrong, and if you love me, you won't write me off because I'm wrong. We've got to come past that day where we judge one another after the flesh. Now, if I'm mostly wrong, you need to find you another teacher. You know? But a couple of areas that were brought up that, that you know, I, I know I am... This whole series of teaching is built on the premise that there has been some deception. And there's something lacking in the church in America. It does not take a prophet to be able to say that. All you have to do is read the statistics. All you have to do is be aware of what's going on around us. Many are saying, at least in their heart, where's the life? Where's what we have read about? And I don't mean by that just the many miracles, but I mean the life. The laying down because the prize is at hand and it's worth so much more than all the world has to offer. Where's the life? I am teaching because I believe God is speaking now. Not just through me, but I believe through many. I believe what I'm sharing you're going to hear in many places. I believe it's already being spoken. But I am speaking, addressing things that have been lost. 
bringing to fullness, or at least near fullness, or to greater fullness, half-truths. That I believe, the, I believe it's the Spirit. You'll have to judge it. And you can't judge it by whether or not you agree with it in your head or it moves you in your head. The only way you'll in the end be able to judge it is to whether or not you're able to walk it out on your feet. I'm convinced that the life is real. And it's worth everything. And I intend to challenge you with all that is in me to give everything you are and everything you've been entrusted with to the King and His kingdom. And I intend to challenge you to go after the fullness of His life with everything that is in you because it's here for us now. But I've been wrong on a number of things, so you've got to listen to Him. But I say things that will challenge you, not not intending to exaggerate the truth, but just simply to lay, lay the truth out. I said something last week that I know more than one shuddered at. After Adam's death, I do not mean his physical death, but on the day that he ate of that tree, it says that he died. Either he died or he did not die. He died. It is, an adic- it is not an adequate understanding of the text to say that his potential for life died. That isn't what it said. It said he died. Because you shall die in the day that you eat it. Well, it's clear when you look at the, the, the full uh, picture that is revealed in the Scriptures that he did die, that the spirit of Adam died. And I made this statement and I showed you from Genesis chapter 5 that Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God, but their children were not. They were created in the image and likeness of then a fallen Adam. And I, how many shuddered at that? Oh, you don't have to raise your hands, but come on. You know, in your own heart. That, that's, that's a little different, isn't it? You've not heard that many places. Because we go to great lengths to talk about man being created in the image and the likeness of God. Well, he was. We weren't. We were born in sin. Before we ever came out of the womb, we were in the fallen nature of Adam, unable to do anything but on our own sin. And both from the Old Testament and then again in Romans, it talks about uh, man's inability to do anything that is good. No, not one good thing has he done? God speaking by the Holy Spirit through his prophet. Because he's been born, not in God's image and likeness, but after Adam's fallen image and likeness. Sin now dwells within that man. Another is on the throne from birth. Long before that toddler is able to even pull himself up on the rails of his crib, he is already acting out of a fallen Adam. And those of you who have been parents very long know that what I'm saying is true. He is already living independently of any rule outside of himself or attempting to by his very nature. But I believe there are many proofs in the Scriptures and I'm not here to... I do not want to go carry it any further, but I want to say to you in this, I may be wrong. Ask God. And I believe He will open up to you the Scriptures. And if I'm wrong, you'll come back to me and point out some Scriptures to me that make it very clear that Adam, uh, that uh, Seth and Cain and Abel and all of the other children, including you and I, were actually born in the image and likeness of God and righteousness was our nature. But have you ever wondered why you do not have to teach your children how to sin? Haven't you wondered why... There are no courses in all of those things. And righteousness is so hard to come by. You ever wondered about that? Well, I believe it's proof of Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. But the more important truth here is I've challenged you. I believe it is significant for this reason. I didn't touch on that just touch on something differently because the whole purpose for bringing that in was to deal with this issue that there was a life in the garden that Adam and Eve had never tasted. 
The point being, we were created for life that is other than Adam and Eve life even before they sinned. We were created for the life that was on that tree, which was the divine life of God Himself. And man from the very beginning was made for God's life. And we cannot be normal men or women without that life. That's the whole point. And to make that distinction in experience is to show Adam and Eve having never sinned but still absent of the life, still unable to live eternally, still needing the life on the tree, but after they sin, having to be driven out of the garden less than their fallen condition with someone else reigning in their heart, having this mixture of the divine nature and this fallen nature, God had to drive them out of the garden before they ever tasted of that for which they were created. That was the point, and as a small proof, I brought forth this issue of created in the image and likeness of God. And there are other issues, I'm sure, and we intend to, particularly when we get to the the three seven-week segments when we're looking for seven full weeks at each of these three things found that were lost both in the garden and have been lost to most of the church today because of deception. We will have ample opportunity for some questions and answers when we'll be breaking up into small groups and having opportunity for some give and take in terms of dialogue. Well, let me quickly just move on into a quick review of last week. We We began, of course, with the exercise. We moved from the exercise to this issue of uh, the church at the end of the age or what would the Laodicean church look like? Uh, What is the rule at the end of the age? And we focused in on deception. Deception is the rule at the end of the age. Many fall away because of this issue of deception. Those who fall away because of deception are not aware of their having fall away because deception itself makes one unaware of the lie or the deception itself. And in looking at deception, we ended up uh, looking at in the ending up in 2 Thessalonians and making this simple point. The reason we are decep- deceived and the reason uh, all are deceived in the end is because we're unwillingness to buy truth. We're unwilling to receive a love for the truth. And that text in 2 Thessalonians is, is one of my favorite texts in this sense. Uh, It's one I refer to often to keep myself safe before the Lord, secure before the Lord. Lord, I know that I, by nature, will choose deception. That is, by, by fallen nature, I will choose deception. I'd like to believe that this is all right and living this way is all right. I'd like to believe that you want me to have my own way. To keep myself from that, I, I just I present to myself to the Lord often and say, Lord, I want to receive from you a love for the truth. I, I want to love the truth that you know I need to love that I've yet to embrace. It is a love for the truth that keeps us from deception. So we looked at deception and then we focused in on three basic deceptions having to do with the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I believe that is the most complete description of who Jesus is. He is both the way and He is the one who has shown us the way. He is both the truth, the truth about God, as well as the truth about man. He is that truth, but He has also come to show us that truth. And He is the life. But not only is He the life, He has come to show us how to live out of that life. Not to imitate that life. I don't know whether I said it last week, but it's been called to my attention. I make a point of saying that in terms of being, and I, I, I may not have included being, but I, I made the, tried to make the point that we, we're not being called to be imitators of the life. In terms of the life, the being, we're not to be imitators. We're to be participators in the life. In terms of doing, there, there are those texts where, we're, where we are encouraged to imitate God and to Paul, for example, Paul would say, be, be even as I am. And in that sense, imitate the doing out of the life. But the doing does not produce the life. 
You cannot imitate the life itself. In, in terms of being, we've not be, been called to be imitators. If you have to try to imitate the life, you may have the life, but you've yet to, dis, you've yet to discover how to live out of it. And we intend to focus on that throughout the seven weeks or the 21 weeks, but particularly in the last seven weeks. So we looked at deception and those three deceptions uh, in terms of the, of the way. And let me give you a little illustration here that will help us. There's a story in Matthew 14. We won't turn to it. It's one you're all familiar with. Jesus has finished a time of heavy teaching to large crowds. Evening's coming. He says, I must get away. He says to his disciples, you get in the boat and you go to the other side. And no sooner are they in the boat than a storm comes. And what would have been a, a two or three hour journey ended up six, eight hours and they still were nowhere near the other side. And the storm was raging very hard. And in the midst of the storm, here comes one walking on the water. It was Jesus. In this illustration, we get a picture of the way, the truth, and the life. The life that we have been called to, now listen to this, the life we have been called to is life out on the water. Jesus was living that life. It's clear in the story that that life was available to all of the disciples, although only one answered the come, and that was Peter. But there is this other life. It is, it is the life that, that lives above nature itself. It's the life that can take a few loaves and fishes and multiply them into many more. It's, it's the life that can take and touch the eyes of a blind man or to, to lift the lame one or to restore the one where life is completely left. This is the nature of this other life. And the early church experienced all of that. And the twelve even in the presence of Jesus, or at least while Jesus was still with them, they went out and they performed all of those miracles themselves. This is the life for which they were called. Not just miracle-performing life, but life that was above Adam's life. Life that was above normal, what we would consider natural life. And we see Jesus coming on the water, and we see Him offering at least a taste of the life to Peter. Peter says, Lord, if it's You... Bid me come out on the on the water. Come. So we have the life. We also have the truth. The truth is, and this is the truth about Jesus as both God and man, the truth is that it takes the reign of God in the heart of man just to be man as God created him to be. The reign was already setting in the hearts of the twelve because when Jesus said, get into the boat and go to the other side, Without an explanation, storm coming, they did it. He was reigning. And so we have the truth here, we have the life here. But what's the way? This is interesting. The way of the righteous man is the way of faith. The righteous man lives by faith. Some of us would think that it would take faith to walk on water, but it does not take faith to walk on water takes this other life to walk on water. It takes Jesus to walk on water. It does not take faith to turn water to wine. It takes Jesus to turn water to wine. Now listen to me. This is important. This is the difference between imitation and the real stuff of. It takes Jesus. He is the life that the Father is offering. It's Christ in us that's the hope. It does not take faith to walk on water. What does it take faith for? It takes faith for the way. And the way is to crawl over the bow of the boat. That's where faith comes in. It does not take faith to turn water to wine. It takes Jesus to turn water to wine. It takes faith to say, bring me those large jugs and fill them with water and then serve them as wine. That's what takes faith. 
It doesn't take faith to turn fish and bread into enough that will feed not 5,000, but maybe 10, maybe 15,000. It takes Jesus to do that. It takes faith to hand Him your little sack lunch and say, here, believing that it's enough. The way is all about getting over the bow of the boat. That's where faith comes in. And in every case, faith comes by hearing. Romans ten seventeen. It does not say faith comes by hearing the Word of God, as it is often quoted. The text says faith comes by hearing, and the hearing comes by a rhema, a particular spoken word of Theos, God. Jesus said, when He called Lazarus forth, He said to the Father, Father, I know that You hear me. But it's because of these that I am speaking this. I already know what you've told me you're going to do. Jesus did not do it on his own. He didn't do anything on his own. But the Father who was in him, he did it. It wasn't the raising of Lazarus that took faith. It was saying, come forth, Lazarus, that took faith. And that faith comes by hearing. Jesus spent three and a half years showing His disciples how to get out of the boat. They really didn't learn it until the Holy Spirit came on them and brought it all back to memory and the pieces started fitting together by His instruction. We're looking at this life that's out on the water. I am the life, Jesus said. We're looking at the truth of the reign of God in our heart just to be normal human beings as God created us to be. That's the truth. The way, which is a radical discipleship, follow me and I'll make you. Come on. I'll help you get over the bow of the boat. And we're going to spend seven weeks on each of those. Getting in the boat getting out of the boat, walking in the power of this other life. That's where we're going. And we introduced that last week by way of the deceptions. I want to move from there, just touching on one other thing in regard to what we covered last week. To most of us, we have been raised with the full work of Christ being three days. Death, burial, and resurrection. I made a distinction last week. I made a point of emphasizing the distinction. There's a difference between His work of reconciliation. That work of reconciliation itself is, is in two parts. There's the blood part and there's the body part. He shed His blood to cover what we've done. But his body was broken unto death that he might break in the dying Adam's race. It speaks of him as being the last Adam. But not just last Adam in the sense of a type or a picture, but in reality, not only did he shed his blood to cover what we've done, but He took on the cross with Him all of those who would believe on Him that they might die with Him in Adam's race. And so Jesus took upon Himself not just the sins, He bore the sins of... Actually, He bore the sins, it says, of all mankind. All mankind. He served as a perpetuation, a satisfaction for the sins of all humanity, not just those who would believe quoting from 1 John 2.2. 2. He, he, he not only bore the sins, He bore the sinner that He might bring an end to a race. That's the three-day work. Reconciliation. 
But I quoted from Romans chapter 5, verse 10, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, three-day work, much more than that which has already in the past been done, in the future you shall be saved by His life. Most of us have known only salvation in terms of sins covered and forgiveness. And that's been almost the entire gospel of the evangelical church. Hasn't always been that way, but it's come down to that in most places. Much is being restored in this hour. It's happening. Talking about something more. And that something more is Jesus spent not just three and a half years, but He has not ceased since resurrection interceding on our behalf that we too might live that life. We are saved by His life. It is this salvation that we are focusing on. Not in any way giving less meaning to or uh, considering as less the three-day work. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit makes it very clear. It's of first importance. But it's not of only importance. It's only of first importance. And the cross, though it is focused in the three-day work, the cross is an ongoing work. The cross has everything to do with the living as well as the dying. We'll get into that a little bit later. The cross is an ongoing work. I... I daily carry about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus. It's an ongoing work, that work. But it's the living that we are focusing on. That has been lost. Much of the church has yet to discover this other life. And it's because they're focusing on reconciliation and sins covered. That's why week after week we have to, we have to remind each other in our messages, that we're forgiven, that there's forgiveness in Christ, and then encouragement to trust His grace to forgive, trust His grace to love us. But a grace that can do no more than cover and is not able to empower us is not a grace adequate to save us because salvation comes from the life side of the cross. For by His life we are saved. And so... We have these two works. We have the three-day work and we have this three-and-a-half-year plus all of the days since resurrection. Christ interceding on our behalf that we might enter into the fullness of that life. That we might live. Not just be forgiven, but live. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. The life side of it. Now, let's take a little uh, mental break. Take a little jump here. This is a little out of the overall outline, but it's important, and I felt to put it in here. I want to talk about the church. And we're going to go for this text. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. You know, when I told some of my ministry friends, those in ministry, that I intended to take, and some of you are still wondering about this, I know you are, I'm going to try and take most of two to two and a half hours teaching. And the response was, we're just not built to listen for most of two hours, two and a half hours. And I spent five weeks in the Ukraine teaching in eight cities. In each of those eight cities, I had to get 24 hours of teaching in in eight different schools, seminaries. I had to get 24 hours in three days. And most of these pastors, in that eight city tour there was in excess of 2,000 young pastors the average pastor had been preaching less had been a Christian less than six years 
I had pastors that were six years old as Christians pastoring churches of a thousand. There were pastors there that were less than two years old in Christ. I would go for two hours and it would be official break and it was a school and someone would ask a question and I'm telling you the truth, no one would leave. It all depends on how hungry you are. And I'm finding a hunger in the church that I've not known. I am seeing hunger everywhere for reality, for the real stuff. So I'm, I know I'm cramming a lot in. I'm going to cram a little in on the church. This is important. Matthew 16. Starting in verse 12. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He was asking His disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So this is a little necessary rabbit trail, but this is an important little rabbit trail at this moment. You know, the skeptics pull this out, and this is one of the contradictions in the gospel. You see, two of the disciples of John the Baptist heard John say, there's the one, and they left John the Baptist and started following Jesus. And one of the two was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And Andrew immediately goes to his brother Simon Peter and says, come, we have found the Messiah. And yet here we read in Matthew chapter 16 that Jesus said, no man revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Contradiction. Ah, there's a tremendous truth here. The objective is not to get them to understand in their head what we believe. The objective is for the Father to reveal something to their heart. And just because we bring a person to a head knowledge of who Jesus was does not mean that they have any revelation to live at all. Once you understand that, you'll know where most of our effort needs to be spent. It needs to be crying out to the Father to prepare the heart for what the Father wants to reveal. And when that heart is prepared, you hardly have to say anything. And they'll have revelation. Because they're hearing someone else. It was not Andrew who revealed Jesus as the Messiah. And before we're over, I believe I'm going to show you where that revelation came. Many are following after Jesus who have never had the revelation of the Messiah. And they have no power in their life to live. And I dare say there may be some here who have a head knowledge of who Jesus is, but whom Jesus has never manifested Himself to. And that's the revelation that Jesus is talking about this. Simon Barjona, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That's the revelation that every man woman needs. It's not our finely tuned apologetic or evangelistic appeal. It's that which only the Father, no man comes to Christ unless the Father draws him. And that's who we need doing the drawing. And so we continue here. I also say to you, verse 18, that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, not to heaven. This is the keys we talked about earlier. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. I hear on occasion people attempting to do the binding and the loosing whom time only proves they didn't have the key. They didn't lock that strong man up and they didn't loose what they were hoping to loose. The fruit was not there. It's because they really didn't know what the key is. But I want us to go back to verse 18. I will build my church. 
And some of you are going to say, John, you're such a contradiction. Do you know what I do for my tent making is I build tents for congregations. And this seems so contradictory, doesn't it? Huh? I build buildings for churches. The kind with steeples on them. I do not build church buildings. The church is not a building. The church isn't a go-to. You don't go to church. And this is where I'm heading with this little interruption here. Jesus said, I will build my church. And she is a living thing. And she is becoming His bride. And she, as Eve was out of Adam's side, this woman is out of His side. His blood, His water, His DNA. She is holy of Christ. And Paul, in a number of his epistles, talks about her as being His very body. And even when Paul is talking about marriage, he makes a point. Marriage is God's show and tell. When I talk to you about marriage, Paul says, husbands, love your wives, wives, submit to your husbands. I'm really talking to you about Christ and His body, the church. She is His bride. And he says, I will make her, I will build her. Well, for years I've been, as a matter of fact, I got out of building buildings for congregations because I was having such a hard time with what I was seeing as the church. And much of my Christian life, almost all of my Christian life, percentage-wise, it's only been in the more recent years that I've been able to get over this, and it's because I had a revelation. And I want to share that revelation with you right now. She's a living thing. But I want you to discover a little bit about her. He says, I will build her. It's interesting that we said about building churches... And he says, I will build her. You go make disciples. And we leave the making of disciples to who? We'll build churches. The Holy Spirit somehow makes disciples. I don't know how it is, but he says, I'll build my church. And the revelation I had is that he is. And he's the only one that's building her. And when you understand who it is who is building this bride of his you'll get a a better view of who she really is. Who is this one who said, I will build my church? Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, the one who said, I will build my church, also says, uh, it says of him, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. We're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Did you know God's invisible? It says that in a number of places in the Scriptures, no man can see Him or has seen Him because He's invisible. I'm referring from Tim- to Timothy. And yet, Jesus was the image of that invisible one. And before it is all over, the earth shall be filled with the outraying, the radiance, the seeing of he who is invisible. The whole earth shall be filled with the glory of God. And just as Jesus said, the glory which you have given me, I have given them. He's talking about that one who is invisible shall be seen. And he's to be seen by Christ and His bride, who is of Him, His body, out of Him. But it continues, it says, For by Him, by this Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And if we were to turn to the text in Hebrews 1, we would read that He holds everything together by the word of His power. That used to intrigue me. I really am, I'm not even an amateur uh, in regard to uh, astronomy or science, 
But this particular area has fascinated me for years, and so I've done a little bit of reading, and I've got a little bit of a library in this area. You know, everything is made up of that which does not touch. Everything's made up of atoms, for example. And the protons and the neutrons in an atom, they do not touch each other. They actually spin around. There's space between them. There actually is far more space than there is matter. Or at least that's what we have believed. There's been what's called the God particle. There's something in all of this space that has weight and energy, but they can't find it. But it says that all of these things hold together. All of creation holds together. What does that mean? What holds an atom together? Well, they can explain what's happening, but they cannot tell you how. And the most destructive force in all of creation that man has yet to discover, caused by man, is when man forces that which God told to hold together, when man forces that atom to fly apart. Isn't that interesting? But he holds everything together by the word of his power. And they don't understand it, but the truth is, I do. They... They just simply heard him say, hold together, and they said, okay. It's only a third of the angels and man that has rebelled. Everything else is crying out. All of creation is suffering and crying out for deliverance from this rebellion. Romans 8. When they are free, finally, it says that the trees shall clap their hands and the mountains shall break forth with songs of praise. I believe it. I do, I believe it. This, by the way, is our solar system, the Milky Way. It's been taken by a number of pictures. It's a composite of at least eight pictures. And I want to pass it around here. We are, don't ask me to point out which one, because there's, there's between two and three billion suns or stars in this photograph in the Milky Way. And our sun is somewhere in here. Now, there's a lot of stars there, isn't there? A lot of suns. A lot of, but this is just one galaxy. But to give you some idea of the, of the size of this, I need a little help here. Uh, before I pass this around, uh, yeah, come up here. Now I'm going to give you something. This is a key. You got another key? Got anything? I've got a comb. Okay. Okay. This is the sun. You hold the sun. I'm going to use you in a minute. This is the earth. And uh, the sun is actually 1.1 plus million times larger than the earth. So I, I could not find something small enough. But assume this is the sun and this is the earth. If you were to put them in a scale where the light of the sun took only eight and a half minutes to get to the earth, you'd have to put these within one inch of each other. The sun, which the light which is traveling at 187,000 miles per second takes eight and a half minutes to get from the sun to the earth. And so here is the sun and here is the earth, okay? You hold the sun. I'm going to let you hold them both. And this is Alpha Centauri. Would you come up here and take Alpha Centauri? Alpha Centauri is the nearest star to our sun. And I want, I want, you need to go out here and I want you to go towards, go, go towards the back of the room. Now, Alpha Centauri is the nearest star to our sun. Keep going. Actually, you've got to go another four and a half miles. <laughs> That's all right. You come on back. This is our Milky Way. Now stay with me for a second. There's two to three million stars, not counting planets, in this one galaxy. And the nearest star to us was four and a half miles away if we are just one mile from our sun. Gives you some idea of scope, doesn't it? I'm going to show you another picture. The new Hubble Space Telescope, a couple of years back, was set to take a picture that took them 100 hours 
they opened the camera lens for 100 hours and they focused it on a spot in space that was void near the Milky Way. Excuse me, near the, the Big Dipper in the sky. They found a spot that was empty. Empty even to our strongest optic uh, telescopes on Earth. And the space that they focused on is the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length from the Earth. That spot is the size of a grain of sand, less than most of the stars we see are that size, but they focused on a spot like that, took the picture for 100 hours, and this is what they got in that little space, and every one of those are galaxies. Every one of those are galaxies. And then they focused in on this little corner, and this is a cutout that shows you, they focused in on this little corner, they found they had to keep narrowing it down so they could count. There are 32 galaxies in this little place, in this little spot, 10 million light years out. And remember, in a second, light travels 187,000 miles. So there's some ways out there. And what they're finding out there is young galaxies, and they are expanding. All of this has continued to expand from the time that Jesus said, let there be. There are billions upon billions upon billions of galaxies. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, is considered a fairly moderate-sized galaxy of the billions upon billions, and there's only two to three million suns in ours. Give you some idea of the one who said, I will build my church. You go the other way. You, you go to the microscope and you start narrowing down, looking at the atom or whatever. You take the, the human cell. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes which are the DNA tags that make up the genetics of man. 23 pairs. There's 46 strands in every cell. And there is approximately 3.1 million tags on each strand. So you multiply 3.1 million times 46 strands, and you have the approximate number of tags in one cell. It's, it's I mean, do you know you cannot live long enough counting to just count the number of tags in one cell? Counting as fast as you can count. And he who made that said, I'll build my church. And when that hit me, when that hit me, I realized she's no cripple. He's spending 2,000 years plus Bringing her forth. She is going to be the most awesome, beautiful, lovely thing of all creation. And when that hit me, it, it, a number of things hit me. One of the first things that hit me was repentance. For judging what I saw was her. And I had to come to the place where I would no longer judge any man after the flesh in the kingdom. We just need to look at one another until we see him, her. She's awesome. She's beautiful. I want to just have you pass that around. Just pass it from table to table. Give some idea of the scope and size. Well, Jesus said, I will build her. But what does she look like, practically speaking? He called her the church, ecclesia or ecclesia. What does that mean? And here again, I'm going to challenge our preconceived ideas. I'm going to challenge our traditions. And I'm not the only one challenging them. The word ecclesia literally means called out ones. It is translated in almost all of our Bible dictionaries as congregations or assemblies. But you need to know that that word was not used in the first century for any assembly or any congregation. The Jews would not refer to themselves as ecclesias in Israel, but they would refer to their assemblies out of Israel as ecclesias. What's the difference? 
Well, the word's a Greek word, and here's where it comes from. This is the root of the word. Prior to Christ, the Greek empire emerged, and it was the most uh, advanced scientifically and intellectually of any uh, empire before it. And the Greeks thought so highly of themselves that when they conquered a land, they chose not to be there just to rule and plunder. They thought so well of themselves that they wanted to give that which was good about themselves to this new nation. And so what they would do is they would send in an entourage of artists and historians and literature uh, experts and and politicians, and the cultural attaches, and soldiers. And then they would erect a local government of local people. But behind the scenes, there was this cultural group, political group, that was trying to uh, bring the culture, the full culture of Greece, into the conquered nation. Now, what do you suppose they called that assembly, that group, that entourage that were called out of Greece to reign behind the scenes in the new conquered land? The ecclesia. The Romans so liked the idea that when they conquered Greece, or the Greek empire fell, that they copied it. They thought of themselves as even greater than the Greeks. And so they copied it. And you know the story. Herod was raised up and there was a Jewish government raised up. But behind the scenes there was Pilate. The real authority rested with Pilate and his entourage. And Pilate did not only have soldiers, he had cultural people who were constantly trying to moderate and be involved in all of the local culture, but with a purpose of of affecting it, of changing it culturally. Now, what do you suppose the Romans called Pilate and his entourage in Israel? Ecclesia. So when Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia, what did they hear? A go-to? A building with a spire? They heard what they knew. And what they knew was an outside government stronger than ours who are here to change us. And that's exactly what Jesus' purpose for the ecclesia was to be. It was to be the government of God in a foreign land. Now hear me, this is so important. In a foreign land who are there to transform this perverse and evil and wicked generation. That's the ecclesia. She is the bride of Christ. Have you heard this? You understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying?